Let's, uh, we should get started here. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, my name is Alex. I joined Heroku about 10 years ago. Um, interesting fun fact is I've come full circle in my engineering life cycle at Heroku. I joined Heroku uh, when they uh, were on the original telemetry team. And uh, after <clears throat> a while, sort of moving around to different other teams, uh, I've come back to a newly formed telemetry team this year. Uh, so uh, this talk's not going to be your typical kind of tech talk. Uh, I have um, a slightly different uh, context of what scale we're going to be talking about today. Because as engineers, we often think of scale of like how many servers, how many requests a second do you do? But we're going to be talking about slightly different uh, scale, um, which leads into the second topic. How do you drive adoption at a large organization? Then we'll go into some lessons that we learned along the way, uh, including uh, a deep dive into histograms, and then some general tips uh, and like how we use Terraform to save ourselves some time in the future. So first, let's talk about scale. Uh, Heroku was founded in 20, 2007, uh, acquired by Salesforce 2010. All right, we do 60 billion requests per day, and we have you know, in, impact across the industry. So <clears throat> that's really 17 years of code. Uh, we have 844 public repositories, and you can imagine how many private ones we have, given that number of public ones. Um, <clears throat> we, we utilize quite a number of different languages, right? So these are some of the top ones, Ruby and Go being kind of probably the two most prevalent, but there's also a lot of JavaScript um, and a bit of Python in there, right? We also are a pretty big organization, lots of engineers, number of teams, right? So this is really kind of the scale that I'm talking about at least for the first half of this talk. So how do you go about influencing change, right? So the change, right, we're talking about here is how do you bring open something like open telemetry into your organization and get everybody on board with this idea? Uh, so <clears throat> quick show of hands, does anybody know who this is? Okay, I see a few. If I said that he's a really famous author, would that raise any more hands? No, yeah, a couple, okay. He is a really famous author. Um, he also has a, a personal development training program that is based off his work, okay. The final hint I'll give you is the book that he's probably most famous for is titled How to Win Friends and Influence Others, <laughs> right? So this is Dale Carnegie. Now you probably know who I'm talking about. Um, so he, in his book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence Others, he kind of lays out a bunch, whole bunch of principles. And we're going to talk about a few of them. And I'm going to tell a story about how we use some of those principles to adopt open telemetry. So it begins with uh, getting the other person saying yes, yes, immediately. So what does this actually mean? It's like, uh, think about asking them a couple questions. You know, you ask them a question, they'll say, yes, I think that's a good idea. Then you ask a follow-up, yes, that's really good. Then you've got them hooked. So this is how we really started our journey, right? Open telemetry, one of its big, big benefits is like, it's an open standard, it's vendor neutral, it's widely uh, interoperable, right? But that's also probably its biggest weakness because it means there's so many knobs to tune, right? There's, you can pick all kinds of different ways to get your telemetry data into the system and out. And then each one of those mechanisms has different configurations. There's different, um, you know, semantic conventions and standards to follow. It can be a nightmare for one team to kind of navigate that path. But try multiplying that across tens of teams or hundreds of teams, and you have a real challenge. 
So <clears throat> when we first started this journey, uh, and I will admit, I wasn't the initiator of this journey. Uh, we had a fellow who set out, uh, and he was really passionate about open telemetry. So the first thing that he did was he created a couple wrappers. So open telemetry has this concept called a distribution. Really, it's just a customized component of open telemetry. We see this a lot with collectors, right? Splunk has their own collectors. Amazon has their own collector, right? So that's probably the most common, but you also see uh, you can do this with the SDKs, right? So what he did was he took our two most popular languages and he wrote small wrappers around them that let him you know, have an opinionated set of configuration, an opinionated set of standards, and he made it really super easy for teams to actually drop this in, right? So, I mean, if, if anyone's familiar with Go and you go through the getting started tutorial, there's like 128 lines of boilerplate code you have to get in there just to get open telemetry working in a basic format, right? So this really kind of like helped bridge that gap to make it easier for the teams to, to adopt. Um, so that was his first yes, right? He went out and he said to, to folks, hey, I can make it super easy. It's basically a one-liner and an import of a package, right? Sold, super easy. The next thing he did to get that second yes was he talked to teams and said, how about my team is responsible for updating this library? So his team took on minor updates through PR requests, right? Super easy these days, just a version bump in a manifest file typically, and then off you go. Um, for more complex updates, he had a whole vision, a plan to do like AST code manipulation and stuff. Um, we didn't quite get there. We haven't needed that yet, but that was his vision. So there's his second yes, right? You now have a guy coming to you who says, hey, it's super easy to install, and two, you don't have to worry about updating it. I'm gonna do that for you. Hey, yes, yes, let's do this, right? So that got a lot of teams on board. The next is really the story about how I got involved, right? Let the other person do a lot of the talking. I wasn't quite sold yet after the yes, yes, right? I still had some hesitations. For me, the biggest hesitation was with this um, kind of library uh, code base that we have at Heroku. It's open source if anyone is interested, Heroku X. Right, so we use this to help bootstrap most of our Go applications. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that this, this library has is a, a metrics library. It's heavily inspired by GoKit. Uh, so if you're familiar with that, this interface is probably pretty familiar for you. Uh, but you've got counters, gauges, and histograms. And so what this engineer did was he sat down with me one-on-one. -on -one and he talked to me, and he asked me questions, and he got me talking. And I blathered on for about 45 minutes about all the things I really liked about OpenTelemetry, but like just switching to his SDK wasn't enough, right? Sure, I could get updates easy, and going, um, plugging it in was super easy, but I still had the expense of 50 services that I needed to migrate to a new metrics, um, API. So in describing this, it was kind of like a light bulb moment for me. It was like, well, why don't we just throw an adapter in there? And he was like, yeah, my team could do that for you. We could build an adapter that takes the open telemetry way of doing things and maps them to that provider interface. Uh, and so then I was like, sold, I'm on board. Uh, so the next principle we'll talk about is dramatize your ideas. Now this one's super easy. We're all probably familiar with this one. You see it any day. You flip on the TV, right? You get those ads. Step foot in the exhibition hall, right? That's all it is over there, right? So at Heroku, we have, um, for as long as I've been there, we have this uh, tradition of doing demo days. At a demo day, uh, it's kind of like used to help um, publish 
or, or promote new feature changes, right? Oftentimes, teams will tie this into their, their sprints. So they'll set their agile goals to be, what, is the, what can we demo next time, right? And so then you have this cycle of like product review with the entire organization. Uh, we also do it for hack weeks, right? So unlike some companies that I've seen do hack weeks where they, they'll post the hack at the end of the week and then there's a bunch of voting that happens and then there's a winner. Uh, Heroku's hack weeks, there isn't really a winner. We're all kind of winners because we focus on watching every single demo that was made. So there might be one, two, or even three demo days that are scheduled so that everybody has a chance, a 10 minute window, to present what they built. Uh, and this is uh, fellow engineer Jesse um, and myself presenting in May of 2023 uh, a Hack Week project that we did, right? The nice thing about demo days and demoing your stuff is it's really easy to know you get instant feedback if people like your ideas, right? It's especially handy if you get the CEO of your company saying yes, right? Then you know you're golden. Uh, the last principle I'll talk about is throwing down a challenge. Now, I'm going to get a little bit creative here and, um, in terms of like the actual challenge because for us, this challenge was actually just a mandated observability vendor swap. So maybe I'm cheating a bit, but <clears throat> we had a, given a very tight time frame. This was an all hands on deck migration Right? Every team in the organization had to migrate from one observability vendor to the next. Uh, and what, what we did, because there was already a few teams that were working with OpenTelemetry already, right? we had that kind of like inception, that little seed planted. The other nice thing was the new vendor supported native OpenTelemetry ingestion. right? So that really helped. Those two things really helped. Uh, and then, of course, the passion from um, the observ our internal observability team and myself, uh, you really helped drive that migration. There was a few other adapters that were made to help some of the really legacy stuff migrate over. Uh, this is actually time frame when I ended up writing that adapter for the provider interface. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of hard work, um, but we did it. Uh, so let's start talking about some lessons. Uh, so, semantic conventions. Now this is an area where I'll admit uh, we kind of fell apart. We had good intentions moving into it, but really that challenge threw us through a loop. Because we had such a short time frame, teams kind of just migrated what they had over, right? Uh, and you know, with all our good intentions to migrate, you know, help teams adopt and bring up the new uh, like standards for how to attribute, like label your, your metrics and, and traces going into the system, uh, it didn't really work out that way. So we're kind of left with these three eras of how we labeled things. Uh, so the bottom two are really like the older style things. And then the top one was added in Right? And this is what you typically do with open telemetry, where you have service thought name and namespace and uh, ID, instance ID. But we also have a lot of systems that still use like component and stage, and then um, a lot of sort of like the very early stuff, right? Heroku, a lot of Heroku is actually built on top of Heroku. And so we use the platform, we use config vars. Uh, and so a lot of config vars were standardized over the years to be picked up as like your service name and where it's deployed. And then of course, all that history of 17 years, you know, you can see like dashboards and alerts and queries are all like playbooks, operations. They all are using these old attributes to help find things. So we have this long tail end migration that we're working on to kind of like uplift all of those things uh, into the new standards. And this is one area where I wish we'd actually pushed a little harder when we made the migration. 
Ah, histograms. <laughs> um, so I'll preface this next bit with the fact that things have changed, right? We did this migration late 2020, early 2021. Uh, and the story here has gotten a lot better. But I think it's worth still telling the story because there's some surprises in there and some little learnings that can be picked up along the way. All right, so this is your typical histogram. Uh, you have, basically, you're just trying to measure how long something took. And every time this HTTP handler is called, it's going to record how long that took to take place, right? Simple, easy. Uh, in sort of late 2020, early 2021, you had uh, the exact aggregation method in OpenTelemetry. And what this, what this did, well, actually, before I even get into what it did, um, we had you know, some early teams adopting uh, OpenTelemetry, and their services weren't that busy, right? So when I talk about going back to the beginning, right, we had 60 billion requests per day. That's talking about routing. Right? But part of what Heroku does is we also offer logging capabilities for all of our apps. And there is at least one log line emitted for every request. Now, how many people in here log just one log line for every single request? Probably none, right? So your application is probably logging you know, 10, 15, who knows how many. So that logging platform sees an order of magnitude more traffic than even our routers do. And so it's probably one of the busiest services we have. So the mistake that we really made was working on the, on the smaller things first. And you know it was easy, right? Those teams got their metrics into the dashboards. Everything looked perfect, right? The histograms were dead bang on. Everything was great until we turned the logging stuff on in production. And that is when everything went for a loop. Uh, our logging stuff, I mean, thankfully we were, we were double writing, but our logging, none of our logging metrics, right? In staging it worked, but we throw it into production and none of our metrics appeared at all. They were just dropped on the floor. We had no idea why. And we dug into it and, the, uh, and then we started seeing errors coming back from the open telemetry collectors or the, the SDKs saying that the, the requests were failing. So why were they failing? Well, we dug into some more. We ended up dumping the payloads. And it turns out the exact aggregation at that time would send every single value that you record. So if you have a service that's seeing 3,000 requests a second, and you're batching and sending those metrics every 20 seconds, that is a lot of data that's going over the wire. We had payloads we were trying to ship to our hotel collectors that were 800 megs. <laughs> uh, so, so we had to fix that. Um, <clears throat> so luckily at the time, there was this other aggregation called the explicit aggregator. Now, we threw that in, right? That was a quick fix. Uh, but when we got to viewing the dashboards, everything was different. It was like, what is this, right? We were seeing like half of the visibility was gone. Uh, and we couldn't understand why until we dug into the actual code. Uh, and in, in the Go Wrap um, SDK, the values for the buckets are actually fixed. You can't change them, right? So the maximum range, there is maybe 20 buckets that I'm not showing here. But you go from 0 to 10 seconds. Well, a lot of our services have much tighter restrictions, right? They have five second timeouts. And some services have 30 second timeouts. So you start seeing like your P99s are above 10 seconds. Well, what does that mean? I'm missing half of what I'm supposed to see here. Or my P99 is like, you know, under five. Like, what is that? It's not, there's not enough detail in there. So we ended up having to custom, uh, write a custom aggregator and hook that into OpenTelemetry um, so that we could create bell curves, right? Because these are just like, I don't know how these numbers were picked, but they're just picked. So we ended up creating ones that would have a bell, right? Because you're less interested in the stuff in the middle 
Are you more interested in having tighter boundaries on either end of the, the histogram? Uh, so that was, that was how we solved that. But now, nowadays, it's a much, much different story. You can use exponential histograms. It's still a little bit funky to actually use them. You have to uh, essentially create a view, uh, at least in the, the, uh, the Go version, right? So you create a, a view, and a view really is two parts. There's kind of like a regular expression part that describes uh, how to figure out what this view applies to. And then you have the stream part, which lets you manipulate what it actually outputs. And then you create this view, and when you register your meter provider and you initialize that, you can uh, you know, plug that view into place. The downside to this is you have to do it at initial initialization, right? which is a little bit weird when you're thinking about where you might actually instrument the code. right? This is happening in like a main function somewhere else in your code base, but where your, your HTTP handler or wherever you're trying to measure this histogram, it's like nested somewhere completely different. So as a programmer, it's hard to cognitively know this. So we did, we did do this, but again, we wrote some custom stuff. So we actually have a custom view that we plop in there, and it's more of like a dynamic thing. So anytime that adapter gets called and you create a new histogram, it actually dynamically creates a view, and then you've got a view that's kind of like overseeing all those things. And so it can figure out how to, how to do this stuff properly. Uh, how am I doing for time? Okay. Uh, let's talk about some tips. <clears throat> double write. I did mention that before. Um, so double writing, at least for a little while, is really important. Uh, so as you're migrating from like observability vendors, or if you're trying to like adopt open telemetry, you probably have something else that you're using. It's really, really handy to double write into two separate locations so you can compare, right? Because there's going to be differences. There's, there's going to be subtle things that aren't quite the same um, that you might need to tweak to actually get them to be the same. Or maybe you can't even tweak them, and so you have to figure out a slightly different way of reporting that. Uh, the other tip I'll talk about is um, with Terraform. So when we did our big vendor migration, you know, this is one thing that we did. So we have, I mean, it's, it's very easy to fall into that trap when you're doing that type of migration because a lot of those observability tools, they're all UI driven, right? They're all fancy. You just go in there, click away, you create a dashboard or an alert within the system. It's very easy to just sit there with the old system and probably that's how the old system was actually constructed in the first place, like right? over, in our case, like 17 years. Um, so you have all these handwritten kind of like alerts and dashboards that folks have created. Uh, but take that opportunity to actually like modularize or, or codify those things into like something like Terraform if you can. Uh, so this, this really like helped speed things up, right? Because like take this example here, this is um, a lo one of our logging services and we have regional deployments of them so that we have data residency. And uh, each one of those basically has its own set of dashboards uh, and sets of alerts so that we can know precisely where, where things are falling apart. So this module, this Terraform module, actually takes care of setting up all those dashboards. It takes care of setting up all of the alerts. Um, and, and really like what we've got, right, is, you know, you've got the source, it's just an inline module, uh, or sorry, the, uh, yeah, the source. Uh, did I put source in there twice? I think I did. So the second source, I was trying to obfuscate a little bit here, uh, is really like, where's the data coming from, right? What table are you le reading the data from? And then we have staging. Then the nice thing with Paraform is, right, you can have objects that you pass into modules. And this is a neat trick because you can do, like, you could pass, like, if you're working with Amazon Web Services, right, you can pass an entire object reference into a module, uh, and you can define, like, maybe you don't need all the attributes from there, but maybe you need, like, an ID or an ARN or something like that. You can define 
like the portions of that object. And as long as that object thing that you're passing in looks the same, Terraform will actually just take the mappings of the attributes and map them into your custom hash, right? So that's how you can get away with like, you know, passing a resource that we just created versus passing a data reference to the same thing. So <clears throat> we have um, stages, right? This is still referring to our old naming, uh, but you've got staging and production. So we've got ways to tune what the two production, the two environments look like. Now, production means different things in different regions, right? We might have different thresholds for what we alert on. Um, so we have this third way of tuning that is region specific. So let's just recap here. <clears throat> when you're trying to drive adoption, right? This is just one way of thinking about it. You've got Dale, Garne Dale Carnegie. He was really good at this. Before he wrote those books and got really famous for his trainings and seminars, he was actually a salesperson. So he's probably the, the best person to talk about selling your ideas, right? <clears throat> so, you know, get, uh, get the other person saying yes, yes. If you remember, that was uh, how easy it is to, to install those SDK wrappers and the auto-updating. Then you've got uh, get the other person talking, which was my story, right? Talking about the pain points of what, you know, migrating to the SDK would involve uh, and exploring the options. Really listen to what they're saying. Uh, and chances are they'll probably talk themselves into it. Uh, and then you've got dramatize I your ideas. For us, that was those demo days, right? Uh, but this can be other forms as well. And then finally, you've got throw down a challenge, right? In our case, it was a corporate mandate that came down, but you can just do this, right? Sometimes just throwing out a challenge of like, I bet you could make it better. Uh, might work, right? Uh, so <clears throat> um, interesting, throwing down a challenge works really good with kids. Uh, <laughs> And then lessons learned, you know, the hard knocks that we faced, right, was like, get your standards right, set a plan for that, and really try to stick to it. Uh, it it's going to take time as teams adopt, but maybe there's like, you know, what we've done is kind of like, you've got all three layers in there. So you can, everything's reported the old way, so the old dashboards and the old things that are migrated still work, but you can start to work with the teams and adapt them to the new way of, of doing stuff. Uh, and the other side benefit is this, is like if you adopt sort of like the semantic conventions that are available through OpenTelemetry, chances are the observability vendor that you're using already has pre-built dashboards that just let you see, you know, how your HTTP requests are doing or something. And then, yes, be aware of what the SDK is actually going to do. Uh, so, my story about histograms, uh, it was painful at the time, going, oh, why is it 800 megs? Um, but, uh, you know, think, thankfully things are different today, but it still does apply. There's still some little nuances and things to really, like, dig into, like, what's the difference between the delta and the cumulative aggregation me uh, methods? Um, so, just really kind of, like, know that part, and then make sure that you kind of um, you know, <clears throat> explore what it's like on either end of the ske of spectrum, like your busy service. Is this going to work with that? And then lastly, you know, figure out, plan for the, for the future. So I kind of talked about, you know, the standard stuff. Um, and then, you know, trying to use something like Terraform to, to modularize and codify your configurations. Uh, so, <clears throat> we're a lot of Heroku's here at the conference. Um, you can come by our booth. Uh, you can go to the website, um, set up a meeting with, a, with an expert. Um, Gail is doing a talk tomorrow, a little keynote, quick, quick talk. Uh, so come check those out. And, and that's it. Thank you for coming.
And we've got about four minutes for questions if folks will have questions. Yeah, there's two mics back there. Yep. So is everything migrated to open telemetry now? Pardon? Is everything migrated to open telemetry now? Yes. Okay. So what's yep. next? What are you looking for from the project upstream? Well, uh, like I said, we still have a lot of work to do with migrating standards over. Um, and we have some adapters that were um, moved or created to help the migration. Uh, one of those, so I didn't talk about it specifically because I was worried about time. But uh, <clears throat> eons ago, Heroku kind of helped create this format called L2Met, which is your metrics over logs. And so we have an adapter that reads those metrics in logs and then converts them to open telemetry. So teams are currently working on getting rid of that pattern in favor of actual metric APIs. Um, and we also have a lot of work left with tracing and guiding teams to do tracing at the right level. Is there anything the project, the, open, the upstream project, could do to make any of that easier for you? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, I think most of it is just like, you know, because it's, <clears throat> you can use, uh, I have seen some teams have success, like, with migrating basically anywhere there's a log line, you can put in a trace. But that does tend to, that's kind of like the quick fix. It does tend to overproduce in terms of tracing, and then you're not, it becomes harder to figure out what's actually broken. Um, you kind of just have too much data at hand. Uh, so it is kind of like a lot of uh, manual effort, if you will, to kind of make sure that, and guidance to help make sure the teams are doing that right, uh, getting the right level of, of, uh, of tracing in there. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, in terms of uh, adopting the hotel collector, like we have the open source one and then we have vendor implementations. Yes. Like if it's a new uh, company which is adapting, what would you suggest? Like which way to go? I think that the answer to that question highly depends on where you're going to send stuff to. Uh, so ADBus is, you know, a good friend of ours and they have their own um, distribution of the collector that works really well with AWS services for collecting this stuff, right? So if you're gonna work with X-Ray and things, like probably that's a good idea. Uh, there's the open source collector, which has, um, there's a couple versions there. There's one they just created that is highly targeted to Kubernetes environments. Uh, and so it has lots of stuff in it to actually make it work and be tuned best for Kubernetes. Uh, but then there's the bare minimum one, and then there's like a everything in the kitchen sink version, which is the contrib, right? So I think it really depends a little bit on your uh, observability vendor that you've chosen, but they all do the same thing. They all output open telemetry, right? So. Thank you. How do you uh, educate or encourage your developers to monitor and Telemetry data. I, can you repeat that, sorry? How do you tell your developers to monitor? Do you tell them to use more logs, more metrics, more traces, or do you not tell them anything? Um, <clears throat> so if I'm hearing correctly, you're kind of asking about how do we educate our, our you know, folks to use tracing? If you do. Yeah. If you educate. So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another good question, uh, and I, <clears throat> so, uh, this, this ha like one of the, the fellow that started the, the whole journey with us, uh, one of the things that he did was he set up, he helped, uh, and we have like an observability team. So we take, usually take someone in, and kind of like embed them with a member of the team that's working on their migration. And so they work really closely. Uh, and one of the things that uh, has had success, right, because it's hard, like you work with them to add tracing, but they're not used to working with it. Uh, so <clears throat> during an incident or shortly after an incident, it's often a good time to go back retroactively and say, hey, this is how you could root cause this incident 
using the tracing mechanisms that we've implemented, and you can demonstrate, you know, he recorded a demo for it, right? And you can demonstrate how you can get to that root cause much quicker, oftentimes. And then, and then that kind of works as an education piece and helps people to understand the, the value of it. Okay, we have 50 seconds, so I think, and I don't see any more questions. So, oh, one more question. Was there any cost analysis done staying on the old system compared to the new one, which is Otel? <laughs> Was there a cost analysis done? Um, <clears throat> yes and no. <laughs> uh, yes, because obviously you always want to make sure that you're not spending an awful lot. And actually, periodically, there's cost analysis that's done. So the observability team actually keeps track of how many, how many events are being emitted. And sometimes, because we're engineers, right? We go, oh, I really like to do this. And you'll plop in a whole bunch of stuff. But then it just overshoots in terms of um, you know, how much data is actually flowing through. And they'll, tra they'll catch that, right? They'll see a sudden spike in metrics or, or variations, attributes, or something. And they'll be able to you know, approach that team and say, hey, what are you trying to actually accomplish here? And, and they can um, help work to kind of like bring that cost back down and figure out what they actually are looking for. Uh, but yeah, I say yes and no because, you know, it was, it was a mandated observability vendor swap. So it was, there was a done deal there. It was like parts of it were, nope, there's no cost. It's like we're getting off of this. Do what you got to do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm over now. So uh, thank you again. <laughs>